welcome everyone to our first CPR International Virtual Organizational Economic Seminar, CIVO for short. Thank you, Bob, for suggesting this, uh, this way of pronouncing it. Uh, so I hope everybody is well in, in these different times. And um, it's, it's great to see uh, so many of you. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's nice that the community is uh, coming together. And uh, so my role here is just to say a couple of thank yous and then hand over uh, the, the ceremony to uh, Morton. So the first thank you goes to Morton because that was uh, his idea, his initiative. And I think it's a fantastic idea. So thank you so much, Morton, for getting this started. The organizing that we put together in uh, an organizing committee that uh, helped out a little bit. And uh, I think we're all here today to, to enjoy the fruit of this. Uh, the second thank is to uh, Daniel Lee for being the first one to, uh, to try this. Uh, we really appreciate it. I'm really looking forward to the paper. And, uh, you know, afterwards you can kind of tell us how you felt as a, uh, as a presenter, whether you found it useful or not. Um, and then the, the other huge thank you is to CPR for um, uh, uh, empowering all of this. Uh, there's a lot of technical stuff that went into this. Um, Organizing these large webinars is not uh, easy, and I'm particularly thankful to uh, Manny Chan for uh, making this happen. All yours, Morten. Thank you. Thank you very much, and let me also say welcome to everybody out there. This is exciting, and it's uh, great that we can do something uh, that's positive in these times. Um, my role here is just to say a bit of the rules of the games today. Uh, first of all, I want to say that we have built a homepage. So for all of you who want to continue after today, uh, please take a look at the homepage. I put the link to the homepage on top of the chat. So if you scroll up the chat, you can see the link to the homepage. It's a Google Doc. There's also an email where we can be contacted on. Um, and in particular, if you want to suggest some good papers or speakers or have any other questions, uh, please contact us. We will read it on a daily basis. <clears throat> the last thing I want to say is simply how we do this. Uh, Daniel Lee had uh, have accepted to be the first speaker here. And we made the following rules, which are fixed for today. And then we will evaluate them and maybe change them in the future. We think about this would be around uh, 75 minutes. Uh, Catherine Shaw, who I don't see. I hope Martin, she, in a <laughs> she just emailed saying her PC is dead. There you go, technology. Oh, okay. We will figure that out in the next minute. So uh, Kathleen Shaw was supposed to be the host. Uh, she would say, welcome to Danielle. Then Danielle will speak for 60 minutes. But within these 60 minutes, there will be four breaks of four to five uh, minutes of questions. And if you want to pose a question, uh, if you're the the uh, panelist here, you can just do it. And if you are attending this, please write them in the chat and we will scroll them through. We have no experience here, so I don't know how many, how chaotic it would be. We'll figure it out. And then after 60 minutes, uh, the talk will end and we will have five, 15 minutes uh, informal discussion for everybody who wants to participate. That's basically the rules. And if Catherine has not found a computer that works, <laughs> then I think we will, uh, Bob, you can maybe introduce Danielle. Sure. Uh, I'll give a classically short economist style introduction, Danielle, as opposed to the lavish sociological style. But uh, we're so happy to have you doing this. Thank you. Danielle, a long time ago, more than 10 years, took a course in organizations and since then left MIT, went to Northwestern, left Northwestern, went to Harvard, and then we got her back. And we are thrilled to have you uh, in this international setting, but sharing you from MIT. Take it away. Thank you for doing this. Okay. Um, let me uh, share my screen. Um, well, thank you so much, uh, Bob, for the, uh, the very uh, kind and efficient introduction. Um, and thank you so much to the organizers for giving me possibly the once in the career opportunity to present uh, my work to this many people while wearing very comfortable sweatpants. Um, so this is, uh, this is joint work with uh, Peter Bergman at Columbia and Lindsay Raymond, who is an excellent PhD student 
at MIT, who is also one of the panelists on the call, and she deserves a lot of credit for doing a lot of technical ML things that are in the paper. And so if you have any questions, um, I'm sure she'll want to jump in at some point. Uh, so this, um, this is preliminary, and so we are very much looking forward to your feedback. I think you might be able to, um, I might be able to get a, a transcript of the, um, of the chat window. So if you just have comments, and even if we don't get a chance to talk about it, um, over the course of the video, it would be great for me to, um, to look at it after the talk. Okay. So, um, so as we all know, uh, AI and machine learning has become a bit of a thing these days, and lots of organizations are increasingly using various kinds of AI-based decision support across a range of settings. So this paper is going to look at the use of um, machine learning tools in the recruiting process, and it's going to focus specifically on the nature of the algorithms that we use and how that impacts both the quality of the applicants that we select, as well as uh, access to job opportunities for people from traditionally underrepresented backgrounds. So one kind of overarching fact to know is that firms are increasingly using machine learning in their recruiting processes in one way or another. And there's been an attendant rise in third party firms that are providing ML based recruiting tools. So part of the excitement around AI or part of the hype around AI comes from a growing literature that many of you have contributed to uh, about how algorithms can outperform humans in a variety of tasks. So this has been shown in hiring in the making of bail decisions and medical diagnoses and giving out credit scores um, in playing chess um, across a lot of different ranges of settings. That said, there's also been this kind of growing pushback, especially within the computer science community, about the nature of um, a nature of these algorithms, to what extent they are fair or biased. And so different people obviously use those words and to mean different things. But one overarching concern is that it's possible that these algorithms might be directing fewer resources and opportunities uh, to people from um, traditionally underrepresented groups. And there's been a variety of papers that kind of document specific instances of that. So what we want to do in this paper is we want to understand um, whether we can construct algorithms that are both accurate, but possibly also um, more progressive in the sense of distributing opportunities um, more broadly. So to kind of get a sense of that, let me start off and talk a little bit about how hiring ML works in practice. The first thing to say is that actually we don't have that much systematic evidence about what goes into commercial um, ML tools, and that's because firms don't typically publish their algorithms or write that much about them. I think part of that comes from the fact that AI in a lot of settings is very oversold. So things are called artificial intelligence when really you're using like a, a quantitative cutoff or like a simple regression. Uh, but to the best of our knowledge, uh, the sort of the cutting edge kind of modern hiring ML tools are based on what's called supervised learning. So in supervised learning, you have a training data set and it's gonna have information about workers and it's gonna have information about their covariates, so their education, maybe their demographics, their work history, so on and so forth. And you're gonna be able to link that to some measure of performance. So whether they were hired, their retention, their job performance. And in that data set, you're gonna form a predictive model that's gonna link um, or really create a relationship between those covariates and those outcomes. And then as you see applicants come in the future, you're gonna apply that model to assess future applicants. Pretty simple. And this is going to work really well if you have a really great training data set. So if it's the case that you see an applicant with sort of this set of covariates, you can look inside your training data set and say, hey, you know, here are, you know, 100 other people that looked exactly like you. This was the outcome for that person. And this is our guess. So when the when the training data is representative of all types of applicants that the firm might encounter, that's going to be useful. And also you want the environment to be stationary. So that the predictions that you made in the training data set that was constructed yesterday continue to be accurate as you apply that in the future. And so an important question is, is that really the case of hiring? And I think there are a lot of reasons to think why that might not be the case. So obviously not all groups are well represented in the training data set and hiring environments change, um, both in terms of sort of secular issues um, as well as sort of organizational changes. So supply and demand for skills uh, could change um, both in general and within a specific firm over time. And so these two issues um, can create a problem for the accuracy of these algorithms. And, the, and this sort of issue might be more salient, especially when it comes to minority hiring. Um, and that's because training data sets are built off of historical human decisions. And oftentimes there's gonna be limited information about the quality of historically underrepresented groups. 
So because you have fewer people in the training data set, you're going to have less precise estimates. So you're going to have a model essentially that works better, say, for white men than it does for black women. As a result, you, can, you might be more likely to hire white men or select white men, not because you're racist, but because you're more confident in your assessments of their quality. But on the back end, what that means is that you might get a self-reinforcing cycle in which there's like a lot of pattern matching between groups that have traditionally been successful in the past and who you now select in the future. So further, if the training data aren't continually updated, this algorithm is going to be slow or not at all. It will not at all adapt to changes in the labor market. So you can imagine that some of those changes are also particularly relevant when it comes to the hiring of uh, minority groups. So there have been sort of substantial increases in women uh, with STEM degrees, for instance. And so if your training data set come from a period where that wasn't the case, you wouldn't necessarily um, apply it in this case. You can also imagine organizational changes. So firms that have employ, um, the implement kind of better practices when it comes to mentoring um, of minority recruits, uh, things aimed at increasing retention. If that's the case, um, it could be the case that you had, um, you had minorities who had lower retention in the past, but you've improved those practices now, so they have higher retention in the future, uh, but that's not going to be reflected in the, um, in the data set that gets used to, um, to train the algorithm. So what we want to do in this paper is we want to pr um, propose a different approach to developing uh, these hiring algorithms. And the key idea here is that instead of thinking about hiring or recruiting as a static prediction problem, to instead think of it as a dynamic learning problem. So essentially you're facing a bandit problem. So you're a firm and you can at any moment choose to sort of play explore or exploit. And so exploit would be to say, let me take the data I have, let me look at the applicants I have, and let me pick the people I think are best given what I know right now. But you can also imagine exploring. So I can hire or select someone from a group that I know less about, but that means in the future, I'm gonna learn about their quality. In general, it's sort of well known that the optimal solution to these types of bandit problems is going to have some balance of exploration and exploitation. And the thing to know about supervised learning, which is sort of like the dominant um, paradigm in thinking about kind of hiring algorithms is that it's myopic. So it's gonna be based on exploitation only. Its goal is to take an existing data set figure out who's good, and how do you select those people. What reinforcement learning does is another sort of wider class of ML-based tools is that it's an approach that's going to allow for exploration. So the way um, sort of reinforcement learning algorithms work is that the algorithm continually learns from every choice it makes. And as a result, the algorithm is going to build in the value of learning um, as it makes its selection decisions. So you're going to value an applicant not just for their direct productivity, but also for the option value they bring in terms of allowing you to learn about the quality of other applicants that are similar to you. So we're not inventing reinforcement learning. It is a widely um, used set of tools. Uh, these are the set of tools that get used to teach um, cars how to drive, for instance. Um, but to our knowledge, and please you know, correct me if I'm wrong, um, this has not been applied in the context of uh, making hiring and recruiting decisions. So we're going to do several things in the paper, which I'll describe over the course of this slide and the next slide. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to build a resume screening algorithm that is going to uh, value exploration. So the goal of the algorithm is to help firms decide which candidates to select for a first round interview. So this is not an algorithm for hiring. It's an algorithm for interviewing. The goal of the algorithm is going to be to maximize the share of people that you interview who are hired. So people who are good enough for you to give them an offer and who also won't want to accept that offer. So implicitly what we're saying is that hiring and interviewing is costly and the firm doesn't want to interview a bunch of people it's never going to be able to hire. So we want to be able to identify the people that actually have a chance of being hired and select those. The specific algorithm we're going to use, um, which I'll describe in more detail later, is, um, is a classic kind of upper confidence bound algorithm. And intuitively what it says is that instead of evaluating people based on your actual estimates of their quality, you evaluate them based on their upside potential. So if it's the case that an estimate is very noisy with respect to certain groups, that means the upside is the upper part of the confidence bound is going to be kind of high. So we're going to be more likely to select that person. We're going to then um, use uh, these, um, this approach and we're going to train that algorithm and test its behavior uh, using administrative data from professional services hiring, so consultants, data scientists, financial analysts, um, at a large Fortune 500 firm, uh, which I, I cannot disclose because they've kindly given us information on all their protected categories. Okay. 
So once we have the, um, the algorithm, we are going to examine uh, it, the, it, the quality of its decisions. Quality here is going to be measured on based on hiring rates, conditional on being interviewed, and the demographics of those selected. And in particular, we're going to generate, um, it's, we're going to compare the decisions of this kind of exploration-based algorithm against three other policies. The first is looking at what the firm actually does, which I'm going to loosely term the human interview policy. The second is going to be based on a very traditional um, supervised learning approach, where we train it on a static data set, um, and then we just apply that without updating. The third is going to be a supervised machine learning approach in which we train it on the same static data set, but as it selects people, we're just going to continually update the, um, update the data as it, um, as it goes. And so one thing I just want to be clear on is that in this, um, in this paper, we're going to receive a bunch of data from this um, company. We're going to take the first bunch of that data, use it to train our algorithms. The second part of our data is going to be sort of the test data, and we're going to think about differences in who gets selected and their performance on that data set. It is not an experiment, and so there's going to be um, limitations in terms of what we're able to observe, and I'll sort of talk through that. But um, it would be awesome to do an experiment in the future, and so if any of you have any leads on that, it would be cool to talk about. Okay, so then we're going to have two extensions, um, which hopefully I'll have a chance to talk about. The first is that we're going to think about the, the role of learning. And the reason we're going to use that as an extension is that in the main data, there's going to be fairly limited scope for learning because it's going to be limited by the test data that we have, the amount of evolution in the quality of applicants that over that period, and also sort of the, the fact that we can't observe outcomes for everyone. So if an algorithm says you should um, pick this person that no one has ever interviewed before, we don't actually know the outcome of that person if that person never actually gets picked. And so because of these limitations, it's going to um, make the learning slower than it would otherwise be if we implemented these algorithms um, in the real world. And so as a result, we're going to have an extension in which we simulate data on the applicants. That's going to lift the learning constraint and allow us to think about how these um, algorithms evolve over time. The second extension is going to relate to how we use information about protected categories in the development of these algorithms. So the main algorithms I'm going to show you today are going to engage in explicit um, what's called disparate treatment, which means I'm going to, the algorithm will treat a black person differently from how it treats a white person. And that's a legal gray area. So demographics here are going to be used to predict the quality of applicants. And they're also going to be used to, um, to assign what we're going to call exploration bonuses. So like just to think about how much we should put the um, help certain candidates be more likely to be selected than others. And so we're going to also consider sort of two alternatives, one in which we remove all demographic information from the algorithm, both in predicting quality and in, um, in assessing sort of the extent of an exploration bonus. And then we will also use another approach in which we um, assign bonuses in a more agnostic way. In the main results, I'm going to show you bonuses are going to be assigned in a way that is linked to race and gender. But you can imagine having an unsupervised learning approach that assigns bonuses in whatever way the algorithm wants to do it, and I'll show you results um, under that approach as well. Okay. So um, we have sort of three broad kind of lessons from this. The first is that this firm can improve their hiring rates and increase representation um, using ML tools. And so our estimates are going to suggest that you can increase hiring rates by about 20 to 30 percent relative to what the firm is actually doing right now with their human recruiters. And at the same time, um, using this upper confidence bound approach, this UCB approach, that can increase the share of Blacks and Hispanics who are interviewed from 10% of the sample to 17%, and women from 35% to up 50%. The second thing is that the type of algorithm actually matters. So exploration is actually going to be important here for driving these results. When we look at the results using these standard supervised learning approaches, both the static and the updating one, both of those are going to do well in terms of quality. So they're going to be able to increase um, hiring rates. However, um, because of uh, the way the data sets work is that when you don't actively value exploration, you actually vastly decrease the share of black and, blacks and Hispanics that you're able to interview. So that would fall to under 5%, um, and in some cases under 2%, um, relative to what the humans are doing. Thirdly, uh, when we allow, um, so right now the um, in the main data set, the, all the ML algorithms will perform similarly in terms of quality. But when we, in simulations, when we allow for learning to be a more powerful force, when we allow applicant quality to change over time, 
uh, then you're going to see that the value of exploration becomes higher. So in settings where we change applicant quality over time, you can see that the UCB algorithm is going to um, catch on to those changes and update uh, more quickly. So that in um, sort of a real life implementation of these algorithms, as opposed to sort of a, a retrospective analysis of these algorithms, it's likely that the role of exploration is going to be um, more important. Okay. So should I take questions now or how should I? Um, how should uh, actually, you can you guys hear me? Mm -hmm. Professor Shaw. Yeah, I, I got a new computer. I'm sorry. Yeah, this would be a good time to take questions. I mean, I'm not really seeing um, much of a chat. So I think maybe um, uh, let me look and see how many hands are raised or, or um, and not really. Most people are participants where they're not involved. So maybe if people could just speak up with a couple questions, we'll see how that goes. And I can also continue if people want to interrupt, you can feel free to interrupt at any time. So, Diana, can I ask one, one question, which um, I, I thought was really, I mean, it's a fascinating thing to, to look at. And I was trying to think that if you were able, I know you can't at the moment to run an experiment in a firm or an RCT in the firm, you know, what, what would be your kind of um, ideal <laughs> type of thing to run? Because in a way, you, you know, you've created something which should you know, be profitable for some groups of firms to implement. Mm -hmm. And the question is, you know, what's the best way for you to try and sell it, sell in a kind of experiment in the firm? I, I would have thought that places where you could potentially learn, you know, learn a lot from doing the kind of reinforcement learning you're talking about, maybe firms with the environments changed a lot. Or have, you must have thought, so just some ideas about, you know, uh, it might stimulate other people uh, who have connections with firms to, to give you offers as well. If you, what, what would you, what would be your ideal thing that you try and get a firm to experiment on? I mean, I think what I would like is to have a situation in which we, we take the firm's sort of existing hiring practices and we say that for some subset of roles within the firm to, um, to implement an algorithm uh, instead of whatever their current practices are and sort of to trace those out. And I think that's actually reasonable in a lot of ways because um, you hear a lot about people wanting to, um, to sort of unearth kind of diverse talent. And actually, in some sense, you can kind of look at the way the um, the human results compare to the, um, the machine, the static, mach the supervised machine learning results, in the sense that they're actually the humans are going to sort of select a more diverse set than would be selected under a standard kind of um, static ML um, algorithm. And so, one way to interpret that, and I'm not sure if that's the correct way, but is that humans are actually engaging in some kind of desire to have diversity in the set of people that they're choosing. Hmm. But as they're doing that, they're also sort of like picking the weaker set of minority applicants. Um, and so possibly the use of an algorithm that values exploration can kind of give you some of the predictive benefits of using kind of big data, um, while at the same time uh, allowing for some of some increases in, um, in sort of representation. Right. Uh, Sorry, Daniel, if everybody uses a similar algorithm, won't there be an excess demand for one particular type of person, which is what the algorithm suggests you should be hiring? And so won't the wage for that type shoot up and the wage for everybody else goes down? So why isn't there a clearing? Why isn't there a role for prices here? I mean, I think, I think in equilibrium, you could imagine that being the case. I mean, in some sense, we sort of see this, right? So like in, in current hiring practices, like some groups are more valued than others. So if you have like a, um, you know, a CS degree from Stanford, uh, you are going to be sort of more valued on the market. It's not necessarily clear that the CS degree from Stanford is that correlated with performance, depending on the nature of the job. Um, but you see kind of a wage premium associated with those qualifications. And so I can imagine that if you use algorithms that then end up putting weight on things that, so like, normal kind of CV variables have kind of like wages attached to them in the sense that we value education and we value these things that we can measure. If it's the case that we can use algorithms that then measure things that are uncorrelated with that or differently correlated, you can imagine then there being sort of premia for, you know, some algorithmic characteristic, uh, which would, no, which I, think you know, I guess where the failure is because you're saying that the algorithm makes a mistake. So the people that the algorithm picks up are not the best people for the job. Oh, so, so, no, so in this case, I actually, um, so we're not going to have unfortunately measures on the, above on the job performance, but we're going to be able to measure whether or not you are um, hired conditional on being interviewed. 
And in our results here, uh, it turns out that the algorithm, any algorithm really, is, is substantially better than the humans. Uh, hi, we, um, we have a lot of questions in the chat now. <laughs> um, and so, um, and I'm still getting used to the technology. I think people can unmute themselves. Um, yeah. For example, Steve, T Steve Tadels has a question about firm size. Maybe if we could start there and we'll keep going. Yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, and thanks everyone for making this work, uh, and to Danielle for presenting. Um, so I was wondering, Danielle, um, <clears throat> for the kind of exploit, explore, balance to work well, I think it's known that you need a pretty decent number of, uh, of data to come into the system. So mm -hmm. wouldn't this be something that would work only for particularly large firms? Yeah, I can sort of see that. You can imagine depending also like so in this firm kind of came to us because they wanted, to, they were thinking about building kind of in-house algorithms. And this firm um, in their data set, so in our data set, we have data set like 100,000 applicants or something like that. But you can also imagine that there are these third party firms that use similar models for multiple clients. Um, and to the extent that they're doing the same job, you can imagine pooling data across, um, across different uh, clients. And so in that world, I could imagine these algorithms working. Um, but I would agree that if we were literally building something in-house uh, with a small, a small kind of firm, that that wouldn't work. Okay, well, we've given permission to a lot of people to speak, but it's kind of, it's kind of, uh, it's weird. Bentley, you were, you were up there at the beginning. Yeah, no. Um, well, this is actually really interesting. I think, I mean, the first step, I guess, um, yeah, thanks. This is a, thanks everybody for doing this. this. is a wonderful way to get to meet the whole team. Um, what one of the things I was sort of wondering is what you're in some sense saying is, and, and I think it's, I mean, Danny Kahneman pointed this out back in the 50s that you know, using uh, some sort of algorithm is better than just using interviewers. Um, I'm sort of wondering that what the, what the UCB algorithm does is essentially put a, a weight on the variance of, of the applicant. And so you're getting people in who have a high variance and maybe the point estimate that their ability is a little bit lower than the average of the pool. But what I'm sort of wondering is interviews are still done fairly quickly. And for some of these disadvantaged individuals, it may take some time like actually being on the job and getting some additional training before they can work up to potential. So I'm just wondering how you sort of, you know, if you get somebody in, they might not necessarily make it to the next round where, where you actually need to spend a little bit more time figuring out whether they're actually capable or not. Just wondering if you thought about that. Yeah, no, so, um, so in this sense, in some sense, like you could imagine that the outcome, the algorithm is going to do as well as the quality of the outcome that we train it on. We are training on whether you're interviewed conditional, uh, sorry, higher condition on being interviewed. And you could imagine that, you know, if there say is racism in the hiring process, that that would show up in that variable as well. And that we ideally want to sort of use like later measures in terms of performance on the job um, and performance on the job, you know, with sort of like various kinds of like organizational support and mentoring. Um, in, in this particular case, uh, we can't do that because they literally hired eight black people. Um, I can tell you that those eight black people are doing fine, um, but they're, the, the, the size of that data set is sufficiently small that it's, there's like right now not much, much we can do. Uh, can I, um, uh, I don't know why you can't see me, but uh, I don't know. Uh, but anyway, so thank you for 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 this. Uh, I just wanted to make two observations. One is that it reminds me of Fama French from '93, sort of moving from market model to three-factor or four-factor model, uh, which basically prices various factors that seem to price assets, whereas before we were using one. And the, the other thing that that Sort of here, it's important to note that in some professions, the option value is very small, whereas in others, it's actually very, very big. And um, the the sort of in in professions like uh, programming on algorithmics, etc., we have some experience with taking underrepresented populations and tripling their salaries over the course of three months, uh, literally tripling. We you can't teach people you know, to be geniuses in, in the course of three months, but you can, you can separate uh, sort of high potential individuals from low potential individuals and that, that is incredibly valuable. So just, just the point to support this. Um, so let me just spend a, a few slides talking about the setting of where our data is going to come from. Uh, then I'll talk about how we construct these algorithms. Um, and then we'll go through sort of the main set of results and then we'll talk about the, the extension, the learning and the 
So uh, this is professional services hiring. Uh, this is a setting that has, I guess, historically um, struggled with diversity. Um, and so, um, you know, this is like a picture of the, uh, the summer intern class um, at a firm that is sort of in the same industry as our firm, but is not our firm. Um, I thought they were very diverse because they took a guy with a man bun, but, um, but <laughs> so it's not actually man bun. But anyway, um, so this is, um, this is a setting where initial interview decisions are actually very important. So our data firm, like every other firm in its sector, is overwhelmed with options. So for every hire they make, there's about 100 applicants. Um, so we see 100,000 applicants, even though only 1,000 people are basically hired. 90% of people are just screened out at the first round before they get an interview. And recruiters make these interview decisions with fairly limited information. So they see a resume review, which means they're going to see some demographics, work and education history. They don't see a cover letter. They don't meet the candidates. And so based on kind of just like this CV information, they're going to reject 90% of people. And these decisions are going to matter. Obviously, it's going to matter for the productivity of the firm in the sense that it's very easy to pass a more qualified candidate if you're just doing this kind of last review. Um, and the, these decisions in this case actually also matter for kind of equality of opportunity. These are jobs that, um, you know, pay 80000 to start and increase, um, and there are opportunities for kind of economic and class mobility. Uh, so we might be interested in, um, uh, I'm hearing a little bit of an echo. I think no. that's fine. Um, so we're going to ask whether ML tools can improve the resume screening process. So, like a very simple model, um, and the models here just to kind of help us understand how the firm is, might use algorithms, um, how that might sort of factor into their decision making process. So we're going to have a firm, um, they're going to make interviews, uh, they're going to interview candidates, and they're going to make hiring decisions. And for simplicity, we just assume that every period they have n interview slots, um, and they can fill those costlessly, and then otherwise they can't make any more interview decisions. Applicants are going to have some binary quality, and essentially this is a potential outcome. This is whether you would be hired if we bother to interview you. And so that exists for everyone, and we're just going to treat that as zero and one. And so the firm, they only want to interview high quality candidates, and essentially their objective function is such that they get a point for every high quality candidate they interview and are able to hire, and they get nothing otherwise, subject to their interview slot constraints. And so in this model, there's not going to be any diversity preference. The firm just wants to increase quality. Diversity is something that we can then sort of see as a side effect of these things, um, but it's not an explicit uh, entry. It does not enter into their objective function. So the firm is going to observe some stuff. They're going to observe covariates X, which are also observed by us. So this is going to be stuff like um, demographics, work history, education history. And they're also potentially going to enter, um, observe some other covariates W, which are unobserved by us. I should pause here to say that the scope for um, these unobservables is smaller here than in other settings. So this is not, they don't meet the candidates, um, they don't sort of interact with them at a career fair or anything like that. They don't see a cover letter. So the things in W are going to be like other activities that the person puts on their CV, like whether they enjoy running or whether they know how to program in Python, or you can imagine, you know, whether the, um, the resume is professional looking, whether the font is good. Um, those, it's going to be that kind of variable. So based on this stuff, um, the firm is going to form some kind of noisy estimate, uh, which we're going to interpret as the probability that a candidate with these covariates is high quality, given D, which is sort of the prior data we have. So you should think about this as implicitly the training data that's available to the person. So if it's an individual recruiter, it's kind of that person's past experience. And if it's an algorithm, it's the explicit training data that gets used. And so that sort of um, estimate of quality is going to serve as an input into selecting the end candidates that the firm wants to interview every period. So this, um, this model is essentially the firm's problem is an example of a contextual bandit. So the firm for every applicant is choosing kind of which arm to pull. It can pull the interview arm or it can pull the don't interview arm. Every time it pulls an arm, the firm receives some kind of reward. So they get zero if they don't interview someone and they get the applicant's quality if they do interview that person. Before picking which arm, um, the firm is going to receive information about the context. Here, that's going to be the applicant covariance. So I know someone's education history, I know someone's demographics, say, and that's going to tell me about whether I think interviewing them is a good idea. So this kind of contextual bandit problem has been kind of well studied in, in computer science and in statistics. And it's, um, there's sort of several kind of solutions that you can make to it. Um, the first is kind of a greedy solution, which is to say, based on your current beliefs, you pick the top end people as ranked by those beliefs. And that has been shown in a range of settings to be suboptimal. B 
the optimal solution to a bandit problem is going to require some amount of exploration. So in a given period, I'm not necessarily picking the people I think are best right now. I'm going to do some exploration. Um, it's fairly intractable to implement sort of the exact op the optimal solution um, to a bandit problem. And so instead, we're going to implement kind of optimal-ish heuristic um, algorithms. And so one of the ones that's sort of been proven to, um, to minimize regret asymptotically is this upper confidence bound algorithm, where we're going to um, evaluate candidates based on sort of the upper bound of our beliefs about their quality, rather than sort of the center estimate of their quality. Okay. I'll go through sort of the exact detail of how we implement that in a couple slides. But basically the idea is that we're going to build three algorithmic interview policies to compare to the firm's actual human decisions. So the first is going to be the static supervised learning approach. And so we're going to take a training data set, which I'm going to call DS0. We're going to train a model to predict uh, whether or not someone is hired, conditional on being interviewed. We're going to rank applicants um, by that score, and we're going to select the top end. That's going to be that policy. The second one is an updating version of that standard supervised policy, where we begin with the same baseline um, model, except for now when we select the top end people, we're going to uh, put their outcome back into the training data set and then retrain the model every period. And then finally, we're going to have this UCB uh, reinforcement learning approach, where instead of ranking the applicants based on just our beliefs about their quality, we rank it on our beliefs about their quality plus this kind of um, exploration bonus term. And this exploration bonus is going to be increasing in the amount of uncertainty we have about the quality of um, that kind of applicant. We're going to then take the people that we select using that approach, put their data back into the um, algorithm, retrain, and then redo it. Okay. So we have several available predictors. Um, we have gender, we have race and ethnicity. Um, and for the purposes of this talk, that's going to be black, white, Asian, and Hispanic. We have their education, um, you know, whether they have a foreign or US degree, their highest degree, whether that's like a master's or a JD or a PhD or a bachelor's, the tier of the university they went to, the major they had, um, whether they were referred to, referred by another candidate, whether they had a prior internship with this firm, their application history to the firm, their prior work history, um, so sometimes the companies that they worked at. And so we're going to have an initial training data set, which is going to be the set of applicants that this firm interviewed between 2016 and 2017. And then we're going to have analysis data, which is going to be all the candidates that they see from 2018 through the end of the first quarter of 2019. So just um, uh, summary statistics for the data. Just like a couple things to note about um, this. It's a majority Asian um, applicant set. Uh, so these are um, applications for um, kind of internal business consulting, um, data science, financial analyst type jobs. Um, they're sort of mostly male. Um, the vast majority of them have a BA degree or a master's degree. Um, most of them uh, attended college in the US um, and a fair number of them attended an elite US college. So there's a good bunch of Ivy Leaguers uh, in this data set. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to build a baseline kind of static machine learning model. We're going to take this initial training data. We're going to predict whether you're hired, conditional on being interviewed, given your covariance. And the specific model we're going to use is going to be an ensemble approach that's going to combine a lasso and a random forest. We can use just the lasso or just the random forest. It's not going to change the results that much. Um, so one way to evaluate the performance of the, um, the model is to think about uh, what's called sort of this area under the curve. And so if you look at the, um, the x-axis here, this is the false positive rate of the model. And the y-axis here is the true positive rate of the model. So if we want to um, minimize uh, true, um, if we want, it's the, in some sense, it's easy to sort of create an algorithm that does well on one of these dimensions. So if you reject everyone, you're never going to have a false positive, but then you're never going to have a true positive. If you, um, if you accept everyone, then you're, um, you're going to sort of perform sort of well along that dimension. And so what we actually want to do is we want a model that's going to be able to have a high true positive rate without increasing its false positive rate that much. So that the curve for a very good algorithm is going to kind of go along this upper corner here. And so the area underneath the curve is a measure of how good it is. And so an area under the curve of 5, 0.5 is basically just chance. Our um, measure here is going to be 0.67. 
And so basically what that means is that we're going to take an applicant who is hired conditional on being interviewed and rank that person higher than a random non-hired person about 66% of the time. So, you know, that's kind of like, it's, it's informative in the sense that it's clearly better than chance, but it's not a perfect model. Um, and for the purposes of our analysis, we're not trying to claim that this is a perfect model. We're trying to say this is a model that we created, um, and I'm actually going to show you that it does better than what the humans do um, in a range of dimensions. Okay. So that's the baseline one. When we do the updating one, we're going to start with the baseline model. We're going to, um, in period zero of the test data, so we're gonna, everything gets trained on 2016, 2017. And in the beginning of 2018, we entered our out of sample analysis data. So we're gonna select the top end candidates as ranked by this, um, this baseline static model. And we're gonna call this set the interviewed candidates IS not. We're gonna then update the model with the data on um, the people that we selected. But because this isn't an experiment, the way that we update is going to be constrained. And in particular, let's imagine that this algorithm says, hey, we should interview Anne. If we interviewed Anne, like if we actually implemented this algorithm and we interviewed Anne, we would find out whether Anne was hired conditional on being interviewed, and we would put that back into the training data set. However, because we're not implementing it as an actual experiment, we can only know whether Anne would be hired if she was actually interviewed in our data. And so the set of people that we're able to up, update our data set with is the intersection of the people that we select and the people that actually got interviewed. And so that's going to slow learning down a lot, um, potentially, because if, we, if the algorithm wants to interview like, candidates that are very different, then we're not going to necessarily be able to update the algorithm with the results of those candidates because we don't actually observe that potential outcome. Okay. So just keep that in mind. Um, and in period T, um, we're going to score the candidates based on the sort of the static learning model, but now trained on the updated data set. Similarly, the US, UCB model is going to have sort of a similar approach. We're going to start off with the baseline, um, the baseline kind of static uh, supervised learning model. In period zero of the test data, we are now going to rank people based on sort of our beliefs about their quality, as well as this kind of bonus term. And the way the exploration bonus is going to work here is that it's going to say it's going to be given out at a group level. So there's going to be different groups of candidates. And we're just going to call that A. And if you're a candidate that's in group A, you're going to receive a bonus that's a function of um, the sigma here, which is the standard error um, in the prediction quality for uh, people from your group. So if it's the case that our predictions are very noisy for this group, you're going to have a higher bonus that bonus is going to be decreasing in the size of the group. So there's more, if there are fewer people in group A, you're going to receive a bigger bonus. And if there's more people, you're going to receive a smaller bonus. And we're going to multiply this by, in this example, um, 1.96. So it's just kind of telling you the upper confidence bound. So one thing to kind of note about the way, there's many ways to construct these bonuses. Um, when, when reinforcement learning gets used um, in other applications, so for instance, deciding what ad, what kind of ad to show um, a consumer, Oftentimes the groups are pre-specified. So you'll pre-specify it based on say like the age or the geography of the person that you're potentially serving the ad to. Um, for our baseline analysis, what we're going to do is we're gonna pre-specify the groups, but we're gonna pre-specify them based on race and gender. And so your bonuses are gonna be associated with um, the variance and estimates for your race or gender group. In the extension, what we're going to do is we're going to give out bonuses in an unsupervised way where we don't specify the groups beforehand and we allow the algorithm themselves to decide what constitutes a group and what is a rare group and what is not a rare group. Okay. And then again, we're going to select the top end candidates as ranked by this score. And we're going to update the model again with the intersection of who is selected and who is actually interviewed. And then in the period T, we're going to score candidates again by our beliefs about them at period T plus the um, plus the exploration bonus. Hey, Danielle. Yeah. Um, would you like to just take questions at the end now because the questions get too complicated? I can't tell how long it will take you to finish. Um, sure. Happy to do that. Okay. As well. But can you finish? How long do you think it'll take you to finish right now? Um, I have not. So how long have I been talking for? Uh, I think I can. Well, it's 945. Can you finish in, in 15 minutes or less? I can I Please. can go fast and finish in 15 minutes or less. Um, <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll go you. a little bit faster. Yeah, sure. thank you, thank you. Also, we're in the results now, anyway. So okay, good. Um, 
So there's actually a lot of results. Um, so basically, I'm going to show you the first set of results. I'll show you our diversity results. Um, and the reason for that is that they're the simplest. Uh, there's no sort of sample selection issues. So nothing kind of econometrically interesting is happening. Uh, the second set of results we're going to um, look at is um, are sort of the quality results, which are going to be about hiring um, conditional on being interviewed. And here we're going to have a sample selection issue in the sense that if an algorithm says to interview someone who was not actually interviewed, we don't observe their true outcome. And we're going to have to deal with that in some way. The first set of results is basically going to punt on that and say, among the set of people, within the set of people who are interviewed, which of these algorithms is more informative about quality within that set. The, um, the second approach we're going to use is we're going to use an instrument for whether someone receives an interview. And we're going to use that instrument to try to understand um, whether there is an alternative interview policy that pushes us a little bit closer to following algorithmic recommendations that can then do better. And so basically, if you are worried about selection and sample selection, uh, the, this is supposed to sort of address that. And if you're less worried about it, um, we can look at the first set of results. And then we'll have our extensions. So the diversity results. Basically, what we're going to do is we're just going to compare the demographic composition of people who are interviewed. And so we can compare that to the people who are actually interviewed. Or we can select the same number of people, but rank them by the static score. We can select the same number of people and rank them by the updating um, supervised learning score. Or we can select the same number of people as ranked by the UCB algorithm. So um, let's start with race and ethnicity first. So panel A here is the composition of the applicants themselves. And so it's about 60% Asian, about 30% white, 9% black, and about 4.5% uh, Hispanic. Um, panel B here is who is actually interviewed uh, by, the human, um, by the human recruiter. And so basically what you see here is that the Asian share kind of stays basically the same, goes down a little bit, um, and then the white share expands largely at the expense of the uh, black share. Okay. So the next slide, I will show you the, um, the ethnicity composition of each of these policies. So again, panel A, this is what the humans are actually doing. If we use static supervised machine learning, um, so this is sort of like the most traditional thing that would be used by like a commercial vendor of, of this kind of software, you'll basically stop interviewing uh, black and Hispanic applicants um, and increase the share of white applicants who are interviewed. And so this is basically saying that within the training data set, uh, white applicants conditional on being interviewed are slightly more likely to be hired um, than these other groups. If we use the updating supervised learning, so we're going to allow um, the algorithm to, um, to update its training data set as we move into the test data set, you're going to see um, a sort of a greater share of uh, black applicants and a greater share of Asian applicants. And that's basically telling you that within the test data, um, it's the case that the white applicants are no longer kind of quite performing quite as strongly on interviews as they were in the, um, in the training data set. And then finally, panel D is going to look at the UCB approach. And here you're going to get um, quite a bit more uh, demographic diversity in the sense that you're going to expand the Hispanic share relative to what humans are doing and certainly relative to the, um, to the static MLs, um, to the supervised learning versions. Same is true for the um, black applicants share. Um, and you have sort of white applicants around 30%, uh, Asian applicants around 50%. Um, so that's kind of the result there. You can also look at gender. Um, here, the applicants are about uh, two thirds male and a third female. The set of people who are interviewed is roughly the same as that. When we use the algorithms, actually all of the ML algorithms will uh, select more women than um, what is currently being done at the firm. And so what that's basically telling you is that in the training data set condition on being interviewed, um, women are probably more likely to be hired. And so the static SL is going to expand on um, the share of women, as will the updating, as will the uh, UCB. So now we now talk about kind of hiring potential. So the first set of results are going to just ignore the sample selection issue, and we're just going to restrict the people who are interviewed. And so we're going to consider the set of interviewed candidates, and we know in our data that 10% of them are high quality in the sense that they're actually hired. And now you just imagine if you could only interview a subset of the actually interviewed candidates. One option would be, you know, you're going to sort of pick the top X percent as ranked by the human, pick the top X percent as ranked by one of the supervised learning algorithms, or pick the top X percent as ranked by the UCB algorithm. And so the question is, which of these sets is going to capture the greatest share of those people who are actually high quality in the data set? 
So the key thing here is that we actually need to sort of figure out who, so it's very straightforward to know who the top X percent is as ranked by the algorithms because the algorithms give continuous scores for everyone. The human though, however, we actually only observe whether or not they interview someone. We don't observe the actual ranking that the human recruiter provides. And so once we restrict the set of interviewed candidates, there's no variance in that. So in order to um, get the human rank, what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to train another machine learning model that's going to predict human behavior rather than, so instead of trying to predict whether you're higher condition on being interviewed, you're trying to predict which candidates get interviewed to begin with. And we're going to use the same kind of lasso um, random forest ensemble approach in order to, um, to run this model. So this model is going to have a higher performance than our previous model. So it's going to rank an applicant who gets interviewed higher than a random non-interviewed applicant about, so that's a typo. So um, it's not, it's, uh, it's not 71% of the time, it's about 77, 78% of the time. And so that's actually pretty good model performance. And so we're then going to use the interview, um, the human score uh, to sort of do these comparisons. So we're going to essentially compare hiring rates among the set of interviewed people for those who have a high human score, for those who have a high um, static um, supervised learning score, for those who have a high dynamic supervised learning score, and for those who have a high UCB score. And one thing to note here is that our human model obviously is not perfect. And if it's the, the extent that there are inaccuracies, that can lead us to sort of misstate the relative efficacy of human rankings, either up or down. So, um, so that's sort of like a caveat to keep in mind when we have these results. The, um, the IB results are not going to rely on a human model, so that's not going to be a problem in that model. So basically, this is the correlation between the scores and quality um, among the set of interviewed people. And basically, you can see that the human model is basically, there's not, it's not informative in the sense that people with higher human scores are not more likely to be hired if interviewed, and if anything, they're less likely. Whereas for, the, um, for all of the um, kind of machine learning algorithm scores, you see a, a strong positive correlation. So that's going to translate into differences in hiring rates across cohorts. So in panel A here, if we were to say, let's be quite restrictive, let's only select the top 10% of interviewed applicants. If we use one of the algorithms here, the top 10% um, by these algorithms, they have hiring rates of somewhere between um, you know, 25 and 30%. Whereas the top 10% of people who is ranked by the human algorithm actually has a hiring rate of only like 8%. If we're less restrictive, we select the top 25%, we're going to get this set of results. Select the top 50%, we're going to get this. Select the top 75%, we're going to get this. Um, one thing to kind of keep in mind here is that if we selected everyone, then obviously it would be equal by construction. So basically what we can do here is if we're concerned about sample selection issues, there's going to be no way, because ideally what you want to do is you want to compare the, the hiring outcomes that people selected by the algorithms against the hiring outcomes for people selected by the human. But the problem is that if you're selected by the algorithm, you're not selected by the human, there's no way for us to know what your hiring outcome would have been, especially if we're going to allow for selection on unobservables. So we're never going to be able to compare the human policy against sort of the full ML policy. But what we can do is we can sort of like use an instrument to try to figure out if we can construct a policy that basically says we're going to, we're going to select like the human policy, but we're, we're just going to shift it on the margin a little bit more toward following algorithmic recommendations. And the way that we construct, if we construct it carefully enough, we can sort of actually assign the quality of these two policies. And so this is similar to an approach that, um, that was uh, in um, Arnaud, Dobie, and Yang, where they look at trying to figure out like um, marginal people with uh, respect to, I think, bail decisions. But basically the idea is that we're going to use random assignment to screeners, so initial screeners who review the applicants, to identify marginal candidates. So screeners are going to vary in their leniency. So some people are going to interview a lot of people um, that they observe, and some people are going to only grant interviews to a few number of people. And we're going to use this to construct an alternative policy as follows. So basically, let's imagine um, the alternative policy I tilde here is going to say, if it's the case that you, are, you have a very high ML score, so if the algorithm likes you, I am going to interview you as if you are being evaluated by a lenient person. So I'm going to kind of give you an easy pass. If the algorithm doesn't like you, I'm going to interview you as if you were evaluated by a very strict screener. So I'm just going to make it a little bit harder for you. And if you're kind of in the middle, I'm just going to interview you as whatever is normally being interviewed. And so we can actually, by construction, we can look at the difference in interview outcomes between um, the, true, the human interview policy and this proposed interview policy I tilde. 
So if the, it's the case that you're going to always be interviewed, no matter who was your screener, you're an always taker, and you're not going to change interview status across these two policies. Similarly, if you're never going to be interviewed, no matter who, how lenient a recruiter you get, you're never going to be interviewed across either of these two policies, they're going to be the same. The people who change interview status here are instrument compliers. So people who are interviewed uh, because they got assigned to a lenient recruiter, but who would not have been interviewed if had they been assigned to a strict recruiter. And so essentially what I and I told her are going to do is it's going to take looking to say, for the people who are marginal, let's follow the algorithm. And so in this case, I tilde is going to do better in terms of quality if it's the case that um, marginal people with high ML scores are better than marginal people with low ML scores. And so I'm going to skip the slide, which is kind of how we estimate it, but basically it's, a, it's, like a, it's sort of similar to a local average treatment effect. I'm going to skip the instrument validity and just look at this. So what a panel A here is saying is that the people with high algorithm scores on the margin have higher hiring likelihood. So if you implement, if you take the firm's existing policy and just kind of push it a little bit more toward following the UCB algorithm, you're going to get um, higher quality um, applicants as measured by hiring likelihood. It turns out there will also be more female, they will also be more black, and they will also be more Hispanic. By contrast, if you sort of construct the same thing, but you push them toward um, the supervised learning approach, you can also get higher quality. You're also going to get more women, but your results in terms of um, racial diversity are going to be more mixed. It's going to be sort of higher Hispanic, uh, but a lower share black. So kind of in summary here, if you can imagine that there's um, kind of like a, you know, a graph of sort of quality on the y-axis and diversity on the x-axis, the human is here. The UCB algorithm is going to sort of be more diverse and have higher hiring rates and the supervised learning um, is going to be here. I think oftentimes firms think of them, like, firms often think that there's kind of like an implicit kind of like bound, like frontier trade-off between you know, hiring rates and diversity. So first off, like there's, if, there's no reason why that necessarily is true. I mean, it could be the case that just more diversity equals better hiring rates. But even if it is the case that there is such a boundary, the firms are gonna be inside uh, that boundary. Okay. Let me now talk about learning. So as we discussed before, um, it's hard for these algorithms to learn because we can't update as much and there isn't that much data. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna conduct a simulation exercise. And the way the simulation exercise is gonna work is that we are gonna take our training data, our test data set, the 2000 set, set of 2018 applicants, and we're gonna change the quality of the applicants. And we're gonna assume, let's say, that actually all of a sudden in 2018, all the applicants from group X suddenly become high quality. Everything else remains the same. So we allow each algorithm to sort of update on the simulated 2018 data. The static SL, nothing's gonna happen because it by construction does not update. The updated SL is going to sort of pick people from 2018 and potentially slowly learn that people from group X are now better. And the UCB is gonna do the same thing. The way we're gonna assess learning is we're gonna say, let's imagine the cohort of 2019 applicants and let's imagine that they show up at different times throughout 2018 which of these would hire the greatest share of the um, set of applicants who are made good. So in this case, you can sort of see, um, you can sort of imagine that the set of said people, if on day one, all of these algorithms have the same beliefs because they were trained on the same data set. The static SL is gonna have the same beliefs no matter what, and this is gonna be the share of, um, so in this example, the black app, we're gonna assume that all black applicants in 2018 are now high quality. So basically we want these algorithms to learn that black applicants are good. The static SL will not learn by construction. The um, updating SL will learn. So if they show up early in 2018 before it's had a chance to experience this increase in quality, it's not gonna select that many black people. But if you show up um, later on at the end of 2018 where it's learned that a whole bunch of black people are good, it's gonna select a lot of black applicants. The updating UCB is gonna learn and it's gonna learn a little bit faster. This difference is going to be more apparent um, in the Hispanics um, population because here we recall that Hispanics were actually the, low, the least represented population, so there's less data on Hispanics. So the updated SL will eventually learn, but in the beginning it's not selecting that many Hispanic applicants, so it doesn't sort of begin to learn until later on. And once it selects some, it realizes they're good and it becomes sort of like a positive reinforcing cycle. The UCB, on the other hand, is affirmatively trying to explore across demographic types. And so as a result, it's gonna pick Hispanic applicants sooner, it's gonna learn about their increase in quality sooner, and it's going to move up um, faster. 
For whites and Asians, you don't see this pattern. You have similar learning across both algorithms. And the reason for that is that all the algorithms were hiring a bunch of white and Hispanic people, I'm sorry, white and Asian people anyway. And so you don't need to sort of affirmatively explore in order to sort of identify these changes in quality. Uh, lastly, you can imagine that the reverse of this exercise where we make all the applicants bad. So now let's say all the black applicants become bad, all the Hispanic applicants become bad, all the white applicants become bad, all the Asian applicants become bad. In this case, uh, you sort of see that eventually the algorithms all kind of learn and they all go down to zero. Um, even ones that have an affirmative desire to sort of explore diversity. Uh, it goes down to zero pretty quickly because if your baseline was under uh, 5%, it doesn't take that much to, to sort of go further down. Um, but for the white share, you can sort of see that um, both algorithms are going to, um, going to go down. Um, I am going to skip uh, this section. It's kind of, it's, it's interesting um, and I'm happy to talk about it afterward. Uh, but so basically um, we build a reinforcement learning algorithm uh, to do resume screening. Uh, we show that that algorithm improves um, diversity and uh, quality relative to what humans are doing. Um, algorithmic design is going to matter in a range of ways. So our standard supervised machine learning approaches are actually going to do well in quality, but gonna collapse diversity. Um, and then uh, there are sort of like interesting things that happen in terms of how bonus structure gets, um, gets decided, but I didn't get a chance to talk about that. So we can, we can skip that for later. Uh, thank you so much. Sorry for, for running a little bit over time. Well, thank you. No, thanks, Danielle. Obviously, we're still learning how to use this in this form for this type of uh, seminar. All right. So what we have is, um, first of all, thank you, because it's, it's great to see, you know, our first day of paper uh, presentation that is but on the frontier in two ways, which is, you know, you're doing machine learning in firms and hiring as your subject. And, and then, you know, um, you're, you know, we're really seeing that personnel economics has to, an, an org has to start thinking about this um, as, you know, our new frontier um, for, you know, exploring new topics. And some people are already doing this. Some, and so as I look at the chat, some people are following very closely um, what it is you're doing. In other words, uh, you know, the, the uh, methods you're using and they're talking to each other. But let me, let me attempt to call on a few people um, to, and I, so I'm just gonna say names. Uh, can people unmute themselves or do we have to do something? Uh, that's not clear. But anyway, here's the names that I have. And also I can't tell entirely whether the question was to you or someone else in the chat. Um, so here, let me start with Iona. Um, did yes, you... I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Oh, terrific. Uh, so I was, uh, I thought it was super interesting. One of the things that puzzled me the most and, you know, I, I wasn't able to have a clear answer in my mind was uh, the issue regarding the prediction for hiring. Um, and, uh, you know, in the sense that we're saying these algorithms are more effective at predicting hiring, but that hinges on your hiring model or your IV strategy. Um, and in particular, I'm wondering, not only does omitted variable bias, which you mentioned potentially with the hiring model, but also we don't know for sure what sort of strategy the interviewers or recruiters are uh, following. And I wonder if you could speculate on that and how you know, if they do certain types of strategies, this could affect the uh, econometric methods that you use, is either as far as the prediction model or uh, the IV strategy, thanks. Yeah, so I think, um, so the selection issue comes into play in two places in this paper. Uh, so one, you can imagine that if the sample is selected, we're training on a selected sample, the algorithm that we train is going to be potentially biased by sample selection. Um, so we're doing nothing to, do, to deal with that. And part of the reason why we're doing nothing actually is, um, is that as far as we know, um, machine learning, like the standard kind of commercially available ones also do nothing. And so we want to kind of understand what happens on, um, when we just sort of have data that's sort of potentially biased in that way. Um, the second thing that the way that this could matter is that that selection, like leaving aside the algorithm, it could potentially bias the, um, our analysis of the relative bias between these types of algorithms. So we spend a lot of time trying to deal with the second kind of bias uh, because that's gonna affect our conclusions about whether this ML is better than this human or so on and so forth. Um, the first part, I think like we could in theory try to build algorithms that are a little bit better about, um, so building kind of selection correction into the construction of the algorithm itself. 
Uh, so the um, the way that they the recruiters make decisions is that they have a rubric, which I actually have not um, seen all of, but they take the um, they take the resume information and they sort of place, they have kind of like weights that they place, they score people based on their education, based on their work history, and they take some kind of aggregate of that. Um, and that's been sort of systematized at the firm like over time. And so sometimes it's it's been sort of a year or two more strictly and sometimes it's a year or two a little bit less strictly. But you can imagine an example of that kind of selection bias could go the other direction. So you can imagine that let's say I'm super, um, I'm super racist. I will only interview a black person if that black person is amazing. In that case, our sample of black people that show up in the training data set are gonna be amazing because they were subject to a higher bar. And so we're gonna actually see a more positive correlation between race and outcomes than we would for the, the whole applicant pool. Um, and so depending on the nature of kind of that selection, uh, that's gonna potentially impact, going to impact the sort of the types of people that the, um, that the algorithms select. Um, we're try what we're trying to do is we're trying to kind of given that compare the relative performance of those algorithms, uh, but we haven't, um, we haven't sort of selection corrected the algorithm itself. Okay, Jean, did you, Jean Kendall, did you have a follow-up or a related question? Yeah, I just wanted to ask something. It seems to me that the size of the bonus is proportional to the uncertainty about a population and is inversely proportional to the size of the population. So for example, and I, I just wanted to double check that I understood it correctly. So if you have, for example, somebody um, in your, in your 98,000 uh, observations, you have a particular, let's say, man from a particular um, university that is in very small group. So you basically mm -hmm. don't know much about them. That yeah. would almost mechanically force you to increase the proportion of these men from that university in your hiring suggestions because their bonus will be bigger. And so it's in some sense, it moves everything a bit mechanically into the center, into, into sort of where the, your relative um, uncertainty about different people is declining and your relative size of groups is becoming it's sort of the, 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 the variance of uncertainties, if I can say that, and the variance of the sizes of the groups are declining. Is that, is that the correct description? Yeah, so I mean, so like, it's gonna, let me um, actually show you some of these, the, the, some of the stuff I skipped. Um, so what you're, so in our main results, this is gonna be panel B here. Uh, the way the bonuses are prescribed is they are prescribed based on race and the gender. So that means um, the man from a universe, from a rare university is gonna get the same bonus as a man from a very popular university by virtue of being men. Um, so that algorithm, so in, in the algorithm we show you, the, the, the algorithm is not, prevent, is not allowed to do exploration on a dimension other than gender and race. Now what we can do is in panel, um, in panel C and D, we can change that and we can instead use, um, we're not going to pre-specify how the bonus structure works, so let's look, just look at panel C for a moment. So in panel C, what we're going to do is we're going to completely blind the algorithm from using race and gender. The way it's going to distribute bonuses then is that it's going to sort of in an unsupervised way kind of learn to think about what group is rare. And this could be involve education. It can involve lots of other things. And so what actually happens in that setting is that you end up Asians get really high exploration bonuses, um, even though there are a lot of Asians, because within them they tend to be heterogeneous. Um, on other dimensions. So there's like a lot of, um, a lot of um, applicants from India say, and you're gonna get uh, college majors that are different. So you're gonna get people who have a major in agricultural biotechnology. And there aren't that many people with agricultural biotechnology majors. And so as a result, um, you're gonna get relatively kind of like these high, um, these high bonuses uh, for Asians. Similarly, uh, whites are gonna get low bonuses, um, not because of their, their race per se, but because they're reg relatively homogeneous as um as an applicant group they all kind of went to sort of like you know top 75 u.s schools they all have a bachelor's degree things like that um and so depending on how the bonus structure the bonuses are structured um it can change a lot the um the, the diversity of the people who are chosen in our models it turns out actually that regardless of kind of how you specify um the the bonus structure they all sort of do better than the human and they're kind of similar to each other in terms of quality um, but they're going to be more sensitive in terms of um, in terms of the diversity of the people who are chosen. 
Okay, um, that sounds good. How about Eliza? And then maybe Andrea, if they're still here. <laughs> Sorry, who was the first? I'm not sure she's has a mic. Uh, uh, Eliza Forsyth. Okay, maybe maybe not. How about Andrea? Yeah, thank you. I, I think um, Daniela just uh, answered my question, which is what happens when we don't pre-specify pre these, uh, these groups. I would be very uh, curious to understand whether uh, minorities uh, kind of getting a sense of the magnitude of uh, who is most discriminated and why, whether uh, minorities tend to be discriminated because they went to the wrong schools um, uh, or whether it's the minority status themselves. So try to, to deeper into this and maybe get some sense of an unstructured analysis of who are the, the, the categories that tend to be most, uh, most discriminated. For instance, I'm, I'm very curious about this uh, sort of um, non-traditional careers, whether those are the people who are most discriminated uh, against, then they also tend to uh, belong to minorities. Mm -hmm. So we did some analysis to think about like what features, so like what variables are sort of driving the, um, the analysis. Um, Lindsay will know it better off the top of her head um, in terms of what features. I think it was, was it education and major or what was it? Um, if you can unmute yourself. Yeah, um, so in terms of, there's a couple of things that play a role, but major and geography of educational background um, seem to be quite important. Um, the other thing is, so I, 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 yeah, I think that's a great idea. We actually, we looked a little bit just kind of like, not in a systematic way, but kind of like, you know, there were very, the, the sort of, there was actually a fair number of black applicants say, but they, the funnel was like much sort of sharper for them when we get down to sort of the eight people who are hired. And so once we were looking at sort of black people who are interviewed and which ones were hired, we, this was like a, a take your data points out to dinner kind of level of analysis. There's actually a lot of black applicants from, you know, from Stanford, from U Chicago, from like, uh, from Harvard, from Princeton, who don't get interviewed. Um, so it's not it's not the case that they went to sort of like the wrong schools. So like white people from Princeton are interviewed at a much higher rate than black people from Princeton say. Um, but I think you're right. We haven't. We, it would be interesting to kind of take a more sort of systematic um, spin on that. All right. Um, how about uh, Constant and then uh, yeah, Constance and then um, Oriana. Can they? Talk. I can talk. Go ahead. <laughs> you. <laughs> now, I, I would like to channel a question which I've seen a lot in the chat and that I also had, which is on the objective function. So if the objective is to maximize the number of uh, interviewees who get hired, we see that this algorithm performs better. But if the objective is to maximize performance, we don't know, right? It depends on the production function inside the firm. So if there are any complementarities or any superiority of homogeneous groups, then you might be better off hiring at the margin yet another white man from Stanford rather than the more diverse. So just to play devil's advocate, but the, the general point is that the objective function determines which algorithm is better. And I'm not sure that maximizing the number of interviewees who get hired is the most meaningful function. Yeah, so I think one thing is we don't, um, I don't think we have enough data on job performance to sort of train models on that because we're also going to have a lot of sample selection um, in that model. But what we can do um, and what's kind of on our, one of the things on our to-do list is to um, sort of look at the relationship between these algorithm scores, um, whether you're interviewed and conditional on being um, hired sort of performance on the job. So we don't have great measures of it, but we have some measures of retention and we have some measures of whether you're promoted within this time frame. Um, and then we have some manager evaluations that are somewhat coarse, but that which still exist. And so I think it would be nice to at least um, see if there's like a positive correlation between these things or if it's like zero or negative and things like that. Um, and we are sort of like working on getting the performance data in order to do that. Thank you. Okay, Eliza. Can you hear me now? Yes. Oh. 
Okay, great. Um, so yeah, so I was just interested in just in generally more about the hiring side um, and that side of the inference process. And one piece I think is whether or not they have a fixed quota of a number of hires each time or do, is there some discretion because that's going to sort of change this um, the inference problem in terms of are you just selecting a fixed number versus is it some sort of benchmark um, cutoff? Yeah, so we don't know specifically um, for any given kind of um, hiring thing, but typically what happens is that there's um, there's sort of like a separate set of openings for roles, um, and then they they sort of conduct interviews to sort of fill out those openings. Um, but the interview slots, um, one of the reasons why we looked at it as a slot measure is that oftentimes uh, it was described to us as basically, you know, if you have this person, this analyst, take the day off to do interviews, like they have this much time, might as well just have them interview that many people. And so it has like a bit of um, a flavor of kind of filling out a schedule. Okay, that sounds good. Um, how about, um, um, I'm looking to see who's left. Um, Kelly Shen. Is it possible? Again, we have issues with muting. Um, okay, how about, <laughs> I, I don't know if the participants can talk. Uh, Catherine, you have to send me a message first. Uh, you have to unmute everybody. Okay, I got you. Um, so, um, then who? Um, you know, then I don't uh, know uh, where we are down the line here. Yeah. Uh, Costas, you should speak. Yeah. Ah, okay, I think, good. Um, I think we are out of time now. Now that I look at it, we promised people. So how about if I have a, you know, I wonder what we can do now if people want to, a few people want to stay around. We are out of time. It's 1015. So we have uh, only 75 participants only. We had, you know, we had about 140 participants. Oh. <laughs> so we have 75 because people are dropping off because this is when we promised to finish. If there's a few people who want to ask questions, um, how, what do you guys think about keeping Zoom open so they can talk to um, Danielle? Is that an option? Okay, so yeah. let, me suggest, let me suggest two things. First of all, I want to say that uh, thank you to everybody. Before you log off, please look at the homepage. The next speaker will be in two weeks and that will be Maria Guadalupe. Uh, and the second thing is I can unmute everyone from now and then you check okay. the chaos that is created. <laughs> oh, I was interested to know, um, has the company adopted and put into production the algorithm? Um, and what, how, you know, how's that been trying to get them to, uh, you know, implement it even non-experimentally? So we have a data use agreement that basically says that we have to like provide free consulting for them to implement the algorithm. Um, but uh, um, we haven't like, we're going to have a conversation with them about like to what extent what they want to use what they don't want to excuse and also a lot of the things that there's like it's kind of legal gray areas around like how the algorithms get um built and so like there's the, the eeoc has two um two principles so there's disparate treatment so you don't want to treat black people and white people differently but then there's also um disparate impact which means you don't want to like um you don't want to select black people at a lower rate than you select white people and so you can imagine situations in which like if you have pure um you know those those two um those two goals don't always align with each other um and so i think there's going to be sort of a longer conversation about like what can be put into the algorithm what can't be put into the algorithm and so one of the things that's actually kind of um kind of nice i guess about the way our results work is that um when we demographics blind it so we just take away all the um the protected category classes information we get sort of basically the same um the same kind of quality improvements um and we also get you know, the same kind of increase in, uh, in diversity. It's just that the increase in diversity is like, um, because of the way the bonuses now have to be given out in an unstructured manner, um, you just, you get, um, you get far fewer white people and far more Asian people um, when we do that. Right. Yeah. Excuse me. Okay. Um, Daniel, um, I just uh, want to ask this question I put in the chat. Um, Probably I'm not quite understand the algorithm you are using, but my question is, um, can the exploration in period T minus one be used differently from exploitation in period T minus one? Uh, 
when you're updating it. It seems like in your algorithm, you're treating, you're adding new in your training set, uh, data set, but uh, you are treating the part that coming into because of your exploration and <coughs> I'm not sure whether I understand it correctly. Uh, and the exploration, these two parts, uh, same, same way. Um, yeah. So the way, that, and, and maybe um, let me let me sort of describe it, and you can tell me if this answers your question. The way the um, so it, the the data, the training data updates, and the training data is an input both into the prediction and into the bonuses. So after every period, the predictions are updated, but also the bonuses are updated. And in particular, the way the bonuses are constructed is that they're a function of the amount of variance. And so if it's the case that, you know, I now, I, um, I selected a black person, so that person's now in the data, and now I have lower variance um, in my estimates for that group, the bonus for all black people will drop in the next period. Similarly, in a mechanical way, um, the more people I have, so the more like women I hire, for instance, that's also going to drop the exploration bonus. So there's a graph I didn't get a chance to show that shows kind of how exploration bonuses evolve over time through the test period. And in the beginning, they're quite high, um, especially for, um, for Hispanics and for uh, Black applicants because there's so few of them. Um, but then as you sort of go into the um, sample further, uh, you sort of see those bonuses uh, going down. So the, there's kind of like an updating on that that still happens. Okay, okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, no, okay. I, I, th I think we're going to wrap it up in, in five minutes. Um, so is there, I can't tell if anyone has one last two uh, question. Can I, can I ask a question? Sure. Uh, I was wondering what the main takeaway is. Uh, I, I kind of lost the main message. Is it that machine learning is helpful in hiring? Is it that in hiring people should pay more attention to exploration? Or is it something else? Um, yeah, so I think I would say that um, uh, the main takeaways are all one, uh, this firm can improve, you can like you can use ML tools to improve um, on both quality and diversity, um, but you can't like the actual structure of algorithms matters and in particular um, using algorithms that kind of affirmatively build in uh, exploration is what allows you to sort of get the diversity results and you wouldn't get that. And I think in general thinking, I mean, I, I think of like the idea of like, so in our data set, like there's not that much learning that goes on sort of generically because of the limitations in the data and because the applicant quality isn't changing that much over time between 2018 and 2017. Um, but I think when you think about like hiring as a problem in general, it makes sense to think of it as a bandit um, because it's sort of this evolution over time. And so um, I think one thing that would be useful is to think about the set of algorithms that we use to do hiring, and it's not clear to me why um, it should be supervised learning, I mean, why we shouldn't have a more dynamic, um, especially because when those algorithms are used are very common in other settings. Okay, um, that was a great summary. Okay, are we ending here? There's a lot of noise now. <laughs> so yes, no, I just want to say thank you to everybody and thank you to the participant, thank you to Danielle. Thank you to the organizing committee and thank you to everybody who shows up and I hope to see you all in two weeks. Thank you.